any any yeah so because i'm sharing if you have any questions you can just uh, unmute your mic and speak is that a question okay so we're going to close Yeah, so as I say, uh, you can store uh, any of your data into your data lake. So it makes it very scalable and you'd be able to run any analytics or extract insights without uh, the need to move your data to a separate system. Uh, it also enables easy data access for different users. And the main thing uh, that makes data lakes special is as I say, because you can store any type of data uh, in them, the schema need not, need not be specified before. You can store it and then decide what to do with it later. So um, Datalic is a concept, so you can implement it using different tools. So for example, in my experience, uh, we built a Datalic architecture uh, using the Amazon S3 and uh, where we stored different types of data in there. And the company I worked at uh, had different sorts of data, like of you know finance data or uh, marketing data, data that came from looks or data that came from different tracker systems. And then you can store it in an SS3. And then from there, you can decide how to uh, filter and use it so you can use data analytics with data warehouses or other systems or you can choose to access uh, files or data that's stored in the data lake using different tools like Tena, uh, where we used uh, which we used uh, which allows you to access your data with like without converting it into uh, a form that can read with the database, it can just read directly from uh, file systems. So the other uh, familiar, or the other popular uh, concept for storing big data is data warehouse. So you can think of data warehouse as a big database that stores different uh, data sources. In many ways, it's similar to data lakes. Uh, and what differentiates the two are the following. You can look at them. So the first is the type of data you can store. So in data warehouse, you can store only relational uh, data uh, that can come from trans transactional systems, operational databases, and other lines of business applications. Whereas in data lake, as I mentioned, you can store uh, non-relational and uh, relational data. Uh, the schema in data warehouses, just like data this need to be designed prior to the implementation. So you cannot uh, implement a data warehouse without creating the schema or without deciding what kind of data you want to store and in what format you want to store it. But in data lake, you can just uh, store the data and decide how to read it later or what to do with it later. Uh, when it comes to price or performance, uh, the data warehouse provides faster square results uh, using higher cost storage, whereas data lakes are optimized for um, optimizing cost for bigger storage like S3. Uh, the data quality, yeah. As you know, when you store data in a database, you have to abide by certain rules. So the types must be defined and uh, then data needs to be cleaned. Uh, but whereas in data lake, you can just work and decide to uh, create later. Uh, most of the time, uh, people who access data from data warehouses would be business analysts, whereas uh, data lakes, because they include different forms of data, uh, data scientists can uh, access from them, uh, data developers can access from them, and other departments or other uh, users can access data from them. The last one is analytics. Uh, so for data warehouse, uh, data warehouse are mostly used for batch reporting, BI and visualizations, whereas data lakes can 
viewed for machine learning, predictive analytics, data discovery, and profiling. So, as I said, you can use data lakes uh, in data warehouse in the same system, but uh, that would depend on the business requirement and then need uh, that specific use case. So, the challenge of implementing data lakes uh, is it turning to data swamp because as I mentioned, you can store any type of data unless you manage it properly, it can turn into um, a mess where anyone can not access data, no one can uh, know what kind of data or what kind of information is stored, and it becomes really hard uh, to provide data access to other people. So the solution for that uh, especially in my case, was to provide uh, data catalog and data, data management. This means that we, while storing the data, we also track uh, information about the data. So, uh, where it came from, what kind of data it is, how to read it, and other sources of metadata would be associated uh, with each data so that anyone that's accessing our data lake can be aware of what kind of data they're accessing and how they can do it. The second is data lineage and traceability, and this would help you uh, explain how your data moves. So you can, uh, anyone can see how a data uh, transforms from one point to another. Uh, and the second, the third is organization structuring. Uh, even though a data lake provides us uh, flexibility to store any type of data, we need to have some sort of and how it's going to be accessed. And there are some concepts that are uh, that would optimize sorry that would optimize uh, accessing our data from data lakes. Uh, they can be like partitioning and indexing, and for that, our data lake needs to be organized properly. Uh, so. Now I'll just go into uh, Kedro. So you might, Kedro is an open source Python framework for creating reproducible, maintainable, and modular data science code. So this framework would help you accelerate data pipelining, uh, enhance data science prototyping, and promote pipeline reproducibility. So you might think, why do we need to use Kedro? So Kedro uh, would help you with your code reproducibility, which means you will be able to uh, easily recreate the steps of a workflow across different pipeline runs and environments. Uh, by itself, Kedro would provide you a very modular way of uh, representing your data, sorry, your code, and also your data. So it becomes easier, uh, it becomes easy and clear to anyone that's using that code base. Uh, the other is maintainability. So, because Kedro uses uh, different code templates uh, and it follows uh, good practices uh, on that are used in software engineering, it becomes very easy to maintain the code base. The other is versioning. So, Kedro would also include, uh, it does also include tracking uh, features, which will allow you to track your data configurations and different outputs of your machine learning models and experiments. Uh, the other is documentation. Um, yeah, so clear and structured for information for easy reading and understanding. And it gives you seamless packagings, allowing data science projects to be documented and shipped, shipped efficiently into production. Yeah, so Pedro is mainly uh, created for uh, data scientists because it's maybe you have seen this in your experience it's really hard to worry both on uh, the structure and the clearness of your code base and at the same time worry about um you know the accuracy and the reliability of your models but kedro simplifies that for you by giving you a very clear structure and then it you focus more on the reliability of your models, your uh, you know different processes that you want to create. So I hope you're gonna use this pipeline and it would make your life much easier. So when you create a Kedro project, uh, this is what you would find. 
So it would contain a configuration file, a uh, data, sorry, a configuration folder, data folder, doc, docs folder, logs folder, not, notebooks, and source folders. Um, so the configuration file will contain files that specify uh, vital information about your data sources, which is the data catalog. Uh, it also includes uh, information about your model parameters and living information. Uh, the data folder, if you're working locally, would include your data, but divided into different layers. Uh, a docs folder would contain uh, the files relating to the product documentation. The logs would contain the log files generated when the pipeline runs out of friend. Notebooks would include a, a notebooks that you create for uh, exploratory purposes and for experimentation. And the source folder will contain actual Python scripts uh, used for running the pipelines. We will see this uh, later on when we create our own federal project from scratch. Yeah, so you might be wondering why is, uh, why did we mention data lake in the first place? So as you know, a, a data science project includes uh, data engineering and machine learning parts. So Pedro would help you on both sides, but uh, we'll try to see today how it can help us on the data engineering uh, side. So the first is it includes uh, a data catalog. So this data catalog would include information about your different data sources and how you can read and store them. The other is a very clear and well-structured pipelines. So this would give you uh, a clear uh, representation of your uh, different methods that will be used to clean and transform your data. And then it provides you with an image. Uh, it also provides you with version. And it, the other thing that's very important to note is it clearly, it just provides you with clearly defined data layers. So this data layers, um, as you can see here, so when you, if you go to your data folder, you see different layers of folders inside it. So these uh, data, this data folders will help you uh, organize your data. So you can store the data as it comes to the raw folder. And as you process it, uh, based on your uh, definition of the different layers, you can store them uh, in the different folders. And that would help anyone that's using uh, those different data uh, to know what what kind of data is stored in that folder, right? So as a data engineer, uh, you might be like uh, be involved in the three folders. So for example, if there is a CSV file uh, that just came, so first you store it in the raw folder. So that's the origin as uh, its original. Uh, you just store it in the raw folder, and then once you export and clean, uh, sorry, like once you transform it into a type and Cleaner version of your data, you store it in the intermediate file. So anyone accessing the intermediate file will know that every data stored in the in this folder is typed. So that means uh, it has a clear uh, it has a type, typing wise clear clean data. And then the third is the primary folder. So once you transform uh, your uh, typed data into So the primary folder will contain data that's converted or transformed in a way. That means it can include data that's emerged from different data sources. Uh, and then from here on down, uh, the MA engineers in your department um, would generate the different data uh, based on this definition. So before implementing in Cadro, we need to know uh, these two concepts. Uh, the first is nodes. So nodes are the building blocks of pipelines. This is where you store all the methods needed uh, for your uh, pipeline to work. And the second is pipelines. Uh, this would organize uh, your different nodes and produce uh, a working workflow. So to create a cadre project, we'll uh, use the following steps. The first is we'd start uh, a new project. 
the second will set up the configuration file and all the needed information. And then the third is will set up the data and then add nodes, create pipelines, run the pipelines and generate the data we need. So let us look at how we can do that. So first we create our environment. Now we are created. Okay, now that we have installed control, we are going to create a new control project. So we say control. So it would ask us to insert uh, a name for it. So we can say and then as you can see here, there are different tools that can be included in this schedule project so it uh, asks us to choose uh, the tools that we want to include so we'll choose the so uh, it also asks you if you want to include an example pipeline uh, i suggest that you do and see how the example pipeline works before you start creating yours but for all sets, so yeah. Okay, so now we here. We have the cut of the Oh, let's move. Oh, you have to other show that this is what a uh, couple a new couple project um would include. So let's update the environment. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, these different folders include different things. For the configuration folder, we want to use all uh, different configuration files. So if you look at space, this is where you put your information about your data sources. Uh, if uh, your data is stored in uh, a cloud, in the cloud, you can still look at the credentials here. As I mentioned, uh, data would have different folders here. So when you get your data, you put it here, and then as you process it, you can use the rest of the folders. And then you can stay in your books here, and then the actual pipelines would be stored here. Um, based on the proof that you have selected, it would give you have a list files, so of course let's install it. Now that you have your um, different packages installed, let's just go ahead and add a data. So let's so let's copy.
copy the contents data to our data folder. So we have our uh, data here. So now we specify information about how to read this data in our catalog. So if you go here, if you go to their documentation, they uh, provide you different ways to uh, provide that information. So let's use this one. So this is the name of the data. So what this uh, code does for us is so a word going to this uh, file bus that you mentioned um, read the data for you and then it would make it available under the main companies so you can access this data using this name for the project so let's say we test that using a notebook so to do that you just need to write a digital notebook. And then let's create some uh, digital uh, instance for us. So we can go here and create a notebook file. Okay, now we can access our data using Catalog. As you can see here, we didn't write the code that uh, you know to read the files. Uh, it got that uh, because we specified it here in our catalog file, so we can explore our data sources like this. Okay, let's say we it um, let's see what they can teach. So this is our data. So now we want to uh claim this data, right? So we want to uh make sure that this percentage size is removed because we cannot it would be harder to process uh, while it's as it is. We want this to be converted into uh, a Boolean value. So we can write code that changes these things. Yeah, is that a question? So what this code does for us is uh, a word that's right, yes. Yeah, as you can see, it's converted. So what this does is it would remove this percentage sign and then uh, it converts this column into a full type and then it uh, divides it by 100. So we have this huge uh, column. And we can do the same for this uh, column as well. But after we, we finish our exploration, we need this to be included in our pipelines, right? Because we're going to use this data to run models or to uh, extract results from it. So to do that, we need to uh, include this code into our source, our source folders. So we go to our source and 
there's a, a golden pipelines. This is where we create different pipelines. So you can have a data processing pipeline, a data science pipeline. This depends on you. You can create different pipelines in here. So a pipeline would uh, represent a workflow. So first, let's create a pipeline. So And then we can go through and under the pipeline survey, we have a pipeline which includes nodes and pipeline sites. So here's where we uh, put all the methods uh, that need to be included in our pipeline, and this is where we organize it. So let's let's copy and then here. So this is. Let's say we are going to move. This is uh, the function that converts uh, the uh, the ITA approved uh, column into a Boolean value, and this one is. Uh, this is a method that converts the uh, company rating into a uh, float. So now we need a method to process using these two functions. So we'll take this. So here, this is the pre process company snapshot. So it goes with a soft data, a data frame, and then the oops implements the methods that we tried on the networks. So we save this and we open our pipeline. And then here we import node and also um, so we import the actual method that's gonna do that for us. So here we have so this is the main uh, thing that we so what we provide here is first the function this is the function that actually does the work and then the inputs companies and then the outputs of pre-processed companies the name of this node so that if we wanted to run uh, only this node we can we'll be able to so now we have this we can uh, run our pipeline um, and get pre-processed companies. But let's uh, go one step further and save this uh, pre-processed companies data into our data intermediate folder. So to do that, we go back to our catalog file and just specify the same thing. So instead of pre-processed And specify our folder where it's going to be written to. Let's run it. So it ran. So if we look here, what is that? Oh, sorry, sorry. My stuff here, I think it was supposed to be in So that's why it created a new folder. So it's just going to make this. And let's put what we wanted here. So now we have our pre processed uh, data stored in, uh, in this folder. Now to the coolest part, which is generating the visualization. Let's 
So as you can see here, it shows us how our data moves. So just imagine this uh, as a complex pipeline, and then we show you the data set that we started with. You can have, you can show the information right here. It shows you where it's stored and some stuff that's about the data set. And then the method that it, this data passed through, um, you can see here uh, the node name, the input, the output, and other information. Uh, you can also see the output file. And yeah, so if you're wondering what this would look like in a more uh, complex uh, scenario, um, I'll be just running the for example here. here it is. So as you can see, we displayed this part of the um, the code base, right? So now we have different data sets. So we have the shuttle's data set, we have the company's data set, and the reviews data set. And they're all um, they're used um, after processing them, they're used to create a modern input or uh, model. And then you can see that we have stored that uh, after the framework with this uh, transformation into this data set. So I hope that was clear. And I have put some like some useful resources uh, in this in the last part of the slides. Yeah, that's it for me. If you have any questions. Yeah, you can. Um, hi, Deborah. Really nice presentation. Um, thank you very much. One question I have is do, Are we going to be using Kedro for our DBT and Airflow project? Uh, so I'm not sure about that. If anyone from the Tina Academy team is here, they can answer your question. Yeah, so up, um, maybe you have to ask them in the Slack uh, after the session ends. So, Abraham asked, is Kadro a substitute for DBT? So, uh, you can, I think DBT and Kadro uh, perform different things. DBT is mainly for uh, documenting different transformations and models for our data, and Kadro is for a full end-to-end -end data science uh, project. So if it depends on your use case and for what purpose you need for. If you're just building a data warehouse uh, that doesn't need much uh, Python manipulation, you can use DBT. Yeah, but if it's an end-to-end -end data science project, uh, I think it's better to use it. Any more questions? Okay, I think there are further questions. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining the session. I hope you learned uh, uh, some things uh, from this tutorial. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll go in the session.